Acts chapter 2. Tonight. If these poor guys ever know which direction I'm going to go toward the platform. Brother Chris Callahan and I used to collide every time. Taz is kind of smooth. He kind of makes things look a little uh, better. But Brother Chris and I, every time he'd, I'd come, he never knew which way I was going to go, and he's a creature of habit, so he'd go the same way. So I thought you were going to come that way. Anyway, <laughs> Acts chapter 2. Everybody's idiosyncratic in their own way. And uh, I've never liked very much. This is just me personally. I'm not against someone else doing it, but I've never liked very much uh, platform presence. I, I remember uh, wondering why guys that weren't doing anything were sitting on a platform in a church. You ever see that? Where you have guys in these throne chairs, yeah. and these thrones, and they sit there, and they're there to let you know that they are individuals of significance. And uh, I don't know. It just rankles me a little bit. I think that uh, we ought to be nobodies. Yeah, Jesus ought to be everything. Yeah, so I realize that you can have you can have people of humility sitting on the platform. That's just you know, uh, it's a, it's idiosyncratic, like I said. But I just think a pastor's just one of the one of the congregation. I'll be as much a member as anyone else, and uh, that may they, it's sometimes best to come from the come from the uh, congregation when you go to preach. But that's just it's not doctrine. It's just my opinion. Well, a lot of times when I preach, I reference the greatest sermons in the Bible. And uh, I believe there are two, two sermons that are the greatest gospel sermons, the greatest messages in the Bible. And generally speaking, if I were to ask a congregation without prepping them in advance, what's the greatest sermon in the Scripture? A lot of times people would say, well, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was the greatest sermon in the Scripture. Now, I don't uh, take anything away from the words of Jesus Christ, but Jesus didn't call that a sermon. Uh, it was teaching His disciples. That was actually discipleship that Jesus was doing. And he was not preaching the Gospel. Matter of fact, I have somewhat, I'm, I'm somewhat averse to calling that the Sermon on the Mount simply because of the misapplication of it. Many individuals have had a real problem understanding the Gospel because of thinking that when Jesus taught His disciples, what He taught them was the Gospel in that instance. And he wasn't. That wasn't the case at all. Jesus was teaching them about disciples, about being disciples and what it was going to be like following Him and how to follow Him. And they'd already, they'd already received the Gospel. When Jesus said, follow me, they were, they were followers of Jesus before then. That wasn't the conversion point for the disciples in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6. And I haven't referenced this individual in quite a while, but he does have some following in the United States at least, and in the last generation or so, particularly among people that are more fundamental. But John MacArthur teaches that that's the gospel in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6. And subsequently, a lot of people have really come into question about their salvation because of not measuring up to the requirements for a disciple. And my friend, you can't do works to be born again. You're saved by salvation. Salvation is by faith in Christ. And John explains what the gospel is in John chapter 3 very, very well. And so when Matthew is giving us a snapshot of who Jesus is, was in what Jesus taught his disciples. Uh, he was not explaining the gospel. And so, if you were to ask, what is the greatest gospel message preached in the Bible, I would exclude the Sermon on the Mount for the simple reason that it is Jesus teaching his disciples. It is not a preaching of the gospel. The word preaching literally carries with it the idea of to declare good news, uh, to declare the gospel. The gospel is good news. So inherent in an understanding of what the word preach means, it means to share the gospel or to preach the gospel. So the Bible doesn't say Jesus, you know, was in a mountain, his disciples came to him and he preached unto them. No, it says he opened his mouth and taught them. And so I do believe that preaching has teaching in it, but preaching also has the gospel in it. And so in the scripture there are two instances and I will just give you my personal litmus test for what I call a great sermon or a great message. 
gospel preaching message. I believe the litmus test would be that it would be preached with the power of the Holy Spirit, with great power. Would you agree with that? In other words, the message preached with great power. Now, I'm not going to say Jesus did not preach with great power, but He was not preaching the gospel when He taught His disciples. Again, okay, so great power. And then number two, I would say a great sermon will produce great results. In other words, if the message of the gospel is great, it's going to produce great results. I don't classify this message anywhere anywhere in the same category, but one of the most famous sermons in the United States of America, at least in generations past, I think that now, because of revisionist history, which reports uh, history from a slant, just reports, reports and excludes, includes and excludes, uh, that a lot of, we don't have a lot of the history of revivals in America, but actually a lot of American culture was shaped uh, by revival and shaped by preaching. Actually, a lot of our culture in our country and a lot of our history was shaped through the preaching of the Word of God. And if I were to ask you, if you knew history, if I were to ask you what the greatest or most well-known sermon ever preached in the United States of America, well, let me ask you, what would that be? Sermons in the hand of an angry God by sermons. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sermons in the hand of an angry God. <laughs> that would make a great meme. False sermons in the hands of an angry God. False sermons? Yes. Yes, it is. Pastor Milwaukee's doing. Yeah, I don't. I don't know anything about him. But he's. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not here tonight. So we're going to exclude him from our service. We want to have a good spirit here. I know we are. All right. So. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sermons in the hands of an angry no sinners in the hands of an angry God by Jonathan Edwards, who read that sermon in monotone, which sermon was also published and repeatedly read throughout the churches in the United States of America, which also has some fallacious doctrine in it if you read it carefully. But all that aside, it's known to be an, an angry sermon, no, an effective sermon, because of why an angry man. What? The Holy well, God's, God used it. In other words, it produced great great results in the lives of people, didn't it? Okay. During the times of the Great Awakening, which that was a part, that was one of the key, uh, that, that, that message would have been one of the, the key moments of triggering those circumstances. Literally cities like Chicago and other uh, Midwestern and, and Northeastern cities would have actually opened up warehouses where individuals who had gotten right, who had gotten saved and gotten their lives changed, could go and actually return things that they, the police the police could not handle. People turning themselves in for crimes which they had committed. Wow. The police departments were overwhelmed. People got conviction. They said, I've been doing wrong. I'm a thief. I've been stealing. I've been whatever. And they would turn themselves in. The police couldn't handle So the police actually set up warehouses where people could come and they could leave merchandise that they had taken along with the address of the rightful owner and connect the person who had stolen with the person who had been stolen from and they could actually return things. And a great morality, a great return to morality actually happened in our nation. Matter of fact, if you read uh, news articles previous to the Great Awakening in America, one of the things you'll come to realize was that America was very wicked at that point in time. A lot of times we think, man, think these are these are wicked days that we're living in. This These last days, these last times are very, very wicked. But actually, if you read history, you'll find that our nation has been where we are now before. But that things have changed because of great revival and because of people turning to the Lord. And so I will say that a measure, at least my litmus test that I'll present to you this evening, for the greatness of a message would be, not only would it be empowered by the Holy Spirit, but it would be preached with such great power that lives are changed and affected by it. And there are two sermons in Acts that are such. And I, you know, if I could be Paul or Peter and just preach this evening, that would be great. A couple of years ago, I had, uh, I played a video of John Rice preaching on the family. Uh, in, in fundamental circles, families were greatly helped back in the 1950s and 60s by a preacher by the name of John Rice. And a few years ago, some of you may recall, I actually played a video of John Rice preaching in our church. I wish I could have John Rice uh, come and preach. Did he die in 1980? He died in 1982, right? Was it 82? I think it was some, 80 or 82, one of those even numbers. John R. Yes, John R. Rice. And uh, so, anyway, uh, if I could have him preach, I'd probably have him come preach sometime. And the same with Peter 
and the same with Stephen, because I think the two greatest messages ever preached are recorded actually in the Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. It's interesting that this would be the representation of what was preached that caused the very same people who had cried crucify Him about the Lord Jesus Christ in the end of the conclusion of the message to be pricked to the hearts and say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then literally the end result was that uh, people were saved and daily they were added to the church such as should be saved. Literally the world as it was known in its day was described in Acts as being turned upside down as a result of the two sermons that I'm going to read to you this evening. Will you permit it? Well, I, I can't be Peter, but I want to read Peter's message beginning in verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that day and notable, great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel of God and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning of him, I foresaw the Lord alway before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, and of the fruit of his, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He saying this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked to the hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And then we see the conclusion of what happened. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto the church, or added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now before we move on to the next sermon, I would like to just do a little bit of sermon uh, observation. If we could just maybe deconstruct Peter's sermon just a little bit. Do you know what gave Peter's sermon such great power? Well, first of all, the truth of the message. What he said was true. The resurrection is what gave his sermon power. See, the very individuals who were responsible for crucifying Jesus could not escape the reality that God had raised him up from the dead. So the first thing that gave Peter's sermon power was the truth of it. The truth of it. And my friend, I have to say to you that the inescapable power or the inescapable truth that gives power to any gospel message is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. The resurrection. And that made Peter's sermon, first of all, a precedent for power. Second thing that gave his sermon power was that he preached the gospel. He preached Joel. He preached David. And he preached with logic. He used strong, large logic. He did not appeal to the heartstrings and the emotion of the people there, though it would have certainly been an emotional group. I don't know if you can imagine what it must have been like to realize that you had crucified Jesus and that God had raised Him up. I don't know what it would feel like to be responsible, one of that responsible crowd who had cried, Crucify Him! And now hearing God hath raised Him from the dead and made Him Lord in Christ. Well, the message of the sermon was powerful, my friend. Very powerful. But David's, or I'm sorry, but Peter's power came from preaching using the logic of what David said. He said, if David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool. If, it, if David said that God has given, that it's, it's an eternal God or that He's eternal, if David said uh, that uh, He's going to be in the heavens... And if, if David said that he's going to be resurrected and he's not going to you know, his, he's not going to see corruption, if David was talking about himself, and by the way, you didn't talk about David to them, he was the great king in Israel, right? You didn't talk if David was talking about himself, how can we have his grave? If he's if he's never going to go into the grave, how come there's a grave for David if it was David? And so he evidenced David knew that he was not speaking about himself, but that he was speaking about one who would sit on his throne and be the promised Christ. Poor Bella's been coughing all day. She's got asthma. You okay, Bella? Yes. Okay. All right. And so the end result, though, was that the, the message was preached, the truth was preached in great power, and the result of it was that a guy who shortly before, literally within a period of months before, had denied the Lord Jesus Christ because of fear of people, preached the gospel to those same people he feared, and saw multitudes saved. And so that's a great sermon, isn't it? It's one of my favorites, probably my favorite sermon in all the Bible, Acts chapter 2, the sermon preached by Peter. Uh, if you'll go with me as well in Acts to. Uh, chapter seven. I like to read another sermon, and this is kind of was kind of brought into. Um, this is kind of brought into context by the reality that the last couple of weeks we've been talking about offices in the church, pastors and deacons. And last week, uh, because we were looking at the office of a deacon, when the scripture referred to. Uh, the benefits of being a deacon, one of those things being that it's going to basically open up uh, boldness in a person, which means that you're going to do things you've never done before. We saw the example of Philip looked at, but I'd like to look more closely at another man who was one of the seven ordained as a deacon, the man Stephen. And Stephen had the same thing happen. He was full of faith and power, and he ended up, um, he ended up going into a synagogue and uh, preaching, and they couldn't resist the wisdom of what he said, and so he ended up being taken. We'll pick up 
Stephen's message in chapter 7 of Acts and just begin reading what the high priest asked him when he preached a gospel sermon. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken! The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child." And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that he should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and a great affliction and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls, so seventy-five people. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money and the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. And when the time of the promise to die, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose that knew not Joseph, which knew not Joseph. The same dwelt subtly with our fathers, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they may not, might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up, and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his brother wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses at this saying, or fled, then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in the bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what's become of him. 
And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered me to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion what he had seen, that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of Jake, of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as said the prophet. Pay attention to this. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and hard uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon Him with one accord and cast Him out of the city and stoned Him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I didn't mention it, but another good sign that it's a pretty good sermon is that they kill you for preaching it. <laughs> and so Stephen, if we'll analyze his message briefly, trace the history of the nation of Israel. And as he's tracing it, it's just historical fact. It's historical truth. But the thread that's being woven from one story to the other, from patriarch to son, from son to son to son, is that they always resisted the Holy Ghost. That they always rejected God and the prophets. Peter looked him in the eyes and he said, As did your fathers, so also do ye. Your fathers were rebels. Your fathers rejected God and the truth and offered sacrifices to Moloch. And you do the same thing too. And so he preached about sin. He preached about hardness of heart. And these same individuals were pretty sinful, pretty hard-hearted. There was one man that heard that message. The man Saul. And he was part of the crowd. When they laid their clothes down at his feet for him to watch while they were throwing rocks at Stephen until he is dead, he was one of the people probably that Stephen looked in the eye and said, Lord, lay down the sin of their charge. And God heard Stephen's prayer. The next portion of Acts really begins the story of the conversion of the Apostle Paul and of the dispersion of the saints because of persecution and the gospel being preached around the world. What triggered all that? Well, it was a sermon that was preached in great power. It was not well received, but it was so powerful it could not be resisted. And that was a sermon by Stephen. And I think, my friend, that those two sermons, as recorded in the Scripture are great and are powerful and ought to be ones that we're very familiar with as we share the gospel. Both of them 
attacked at a little bit of a different angle, a little bit of a different direction. Peter used the psalmist David in his prophecy to prove that Jesus was Christ. Stephen threaded the rebellion of God's people from generation to generation to generation to the generation that he preached to to say you're just like them. You talk about Moses. You talk about Abraham. You talk about David. You talk about your fathers, the patriarchs. Your fathers were a bunch of godless rebels. And so are you. It wasn't well received at the moment, but it turned the world upside down. So I thought it would be a good idea for us to just have a little bit of a look at what good preaching is. Because I'd say those were some pretty great messages that were preached, aren't they? Father, thank You for what we've learned from the preaching of Your Word this evening. And I ask You to help us to absorb and to apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. I found that in the Bible. <laughs>